Welcome to Cane Ridge, east of Paris in Bourbon County, birthplace of Central Christian Church of Lexington and one of the birthplaces of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Cane Ridge, named after a ridge of cane, this bamboo-like plant that was a ridge 15 miles long and half again as wide that was seen by no, none other than Daniel Boone. And Daniel Boone invited his friends from North Carolina to come out here to Cane Ridge and to start a church. And so they did, a Presbyterian church, the Cane Ridge Presbyterian Church that was founded in 1791, a year before the state of Kentucky entered the Union. In 1796, a young pastor by the name of Barton Warren Stone was called to come here to be the pastor of this congregation. He came, and during that time period, known by religious historians as the Second Great Awakening, there were a series of revivals across what is known as the Western Frontier. Stone and his Cane Ridge Presbyterian Church decided that they wanted to host a revival. At the time of the year, they normally had their communion service. And so they sent invitations out far and wide to an August date in 1801. Guess what? 20 to 30,000 people came out here on the American frontier for what turned out to be a week of worship where Presbyterians and Baptists and Methodists took turns preaching, sometimes five at a time throughout these grounds to the gathered crowds. There were some very extraordinary expressions of Pentecostal fervor that broke out all over this place. I did say it was a revival, right? And it ended after a week only because they had run out of food and there was no more grass for the horses. And so ended the week-long Cane Ridge Revival. Barton Stone remained here as the pastor until 1815 he moved to Lexington and in 1816 founded what is today Central Christian Church of Lexington, Kentucky. So members and friends of Central Christian, welcome home. Welcome to Cane Ridge. Let's go inside.
welcome inside. And now in the words of our host, Reverend Barton Warren Stone, brothers and sisters, let us not neglect to meet together every Lord's Day for worship. Meet and read the scripture. Sing, pray, and exhort one another, for it will be found profitable and pleasant. How pleasant it is to be with you today from the birthplace of our church, the Cane Ridge Meeting House. I have with me today our double quartet singing music from the late 1700s and the early 1800s, including Hayden Bright and Will Mason Walker and Michael Rintema and Grant Holcomb, Amy Kate Smith, Jessica Bain, Ruthie Sangster, and Katherine Olson. We're grateful that they have made the trek across the rolling roads out of Fayette County into Bourbon County, through Paris and out here to Cane Ridge. We're going to be having this Wednesday night a Vesper service at 7 p.m. If you've not yet made a reservation, please call the church office. Again, this is a service that's observed with all health precautions. Masks are mandatory. We'll be receiving a temperature check from our parish nurses as you enter. We maintain social distancing. Please call the church office to reserve a place for these 40-minute services. The next one again, this Wednesday, July 29th at 7 p.m. As we turn to our prayer concerns, we have numerous members who have been hospitalized and are at home recovering or, or ailing or uh, nursing an injury. And let me just name their names as we continue to surround them in prayer. Jill Harris and Ethel Walker. Ann Thompson, Terry Teasdale, Shelley Ferguson, and, and Bobby Thompson. We're holding Sarah Rose Isaacs in our prayers during uh, this stage of her pregnancy, and we hold uh, Donna Rose and Doug as well as they uh, stay there with Sarah Rose. We hold Bob Stoffer in our prayers in the death uh, last week of Martha Nell. Graveside services were earlier this past week. And we also hold Bud Hall in our prayers as he anticipates a trip to Cleveland for surgery uh, in the near future. Uh, the Surratts, as they deal with COVID tests that have turned up positive for Dewan and for DeMarcus. Thankfully, they're both feeling well, but we hold that entire family in our prayers. As we turn to our time of prayer, this being place of the birth of our Christian church, Disciples of Christ, we're going to say together the disciple affirmation. I'm going to have the choir join me in saying it aloud as a prayer of profession before our God, and then we will close by saying together the Lord's Prayer. We confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and proclaim Him Lord and Savior of the world. In His name and by His grace, we accept our mission of witness and service to all people. We rejoice in God, maker of heaven and earth, and in the covenant of love which binds us to God and to one another. Through baptism into Christ, we enter into newness of life and are made one with the whole people of God. In the communion of the Holy Spirit, we are joined together in discipleship and in obedience to Christ. At the table of the Lord, we celebrate with thanksgiving the saving acts and presence of Christ. Within the universal church, we receive the gift of ministry and the light of scripture. In the bonds of Christian faith, we yield ourselves to God that we may serve the one whose kingdom has no end. Blessing, glory, and honor be to God forever. 
This we pray in the way that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, I'm your host, Colin Pilkington, and we are here with CCCN's Live on Location. We now go to our reporter in the field. Colin? Thank you, Colin. I'm here live on location at the Cane Ridge Meeting House. This quaint log cabin was built in 1791 here in Bourbon County and was the host of a multi-day conference known as the Great Revival over the course of seven days in August of 1801. One such preacher in attendance, a Reverend Bart Stone, will go on to be a founder of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Reverend Stone is also credited as the founding minister of Central Christian Church, who, is, who our network is tied to. This has been Colin Pilkington, live on location, wishing you all well. Martin Stone wrote, it may be asked, how are all to get to the one spirit of Christ? I know of no better way than to believe on Jesus through the words of the apostles or to believe on him as the scripture hath said. And let us therefore look to scripture from Acts chapter 20 verses 17 through 21. Verses of scripture that Barton Warren Stone 
preached on the last time he preached from this pulpit at Cambridge. Listen for God's word. From Miletus, he sent a message to Ephesus asking the elders of the church to meet him. When they came to him, Paul, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the entire time from the first day I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears, enduring the trials that came to me of the Jews. I did not shrink from doing anything helpful, proclaiming the message to you and teaching publicly and from house to house as I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was 177 years ago this summer, August 21st, 1843 to be exact, that Barton Warren Stone preached his final sermon here at Cane Ridge. Seven years earlier, in 1836, he had moved to Jacksonville, Illinois, where in 1841 he suffered a stroke that uh, debilitated him physically and took away his speech, but in time he was able to walk with a cane and able to regain his capacity to speak in a way that was understandable. And so in 1843, he decided he would make a final tour of his beloved Kentucky. And when so many people just implored him to, to preach one more time, he agreed to do it on August 21st of 1843. As you might imagine, his last sermon here at Cane Ridge was a very emotional uh, occasion. This old church was packed. People stood outside at the windows in order to hear what the beloved man they called Elder Stone was going to say for his last sermon. A man by the name of John Rogers who wrote a biography of Barton Warren Stone was there and he wrote, while memory lives, I can never forget that day. The circumstances of that parting scene are indelibly engraved on the tablets of my heart. With staff in hand, the venerable man limps into the pulpit, which he so often had filled for near 47 years. The silence of death pervades the audience. All are leaning forward with intense interest to hear the last instructions, admonitions, and exhortations from their father in the gospel. And so it was 177 years ago when Barton Warren Stone preached here for the last time in the Cane Ridge Meeting House. You know, it's amazing that day ever came to pass because when Barton Stone went off to school in Guilford County, now Greensboro, North Carolina, he was set on being a lawyer. Frankly, he wanted nothing to do with religion. And so when he was among friends who were caught up in some of the religious fervor of the time, he was determined to, to leave and go to school somewhere else to, quote, get away from the constant sight of religion. But bad weather prevented him from leaving, and he ended up staying there in North Carolina. Uh, in time, with the invitation of some friends urging him to do so, he went to a worship service where a man uh, by the name of James McGrady preached a hellfire damnation sermon that scared the living daylights out of young Barton Warren Stone. And for a full year, he wrote, I was tossed on the waves of uncertainty, sometimes desponding, almost despairing. 
But in 1791, he, he mustered the courage to go to another service, and he heard a man by the name of William Hodge preach a sermon on God is love. And Barton Warren Stone's life was changed. He was converted. In May of 1793, he became a candidate for the ministry in the Presbyterian Church. And in 1796, he was called to be the pastor right here at the Cane Ridge Presbyterian Church. Mark then that as Barton Warren Stone's spiritual heirs, as Stone's own, if you will, we're the spiritual ancestors of a man who was repulsed by hellfire and damnation religion, but who was won over and transformed for life by the message of God's love for all people. What did he do during the years that he was in ministry here at Cane Ridge, the years that continued when he moved to Lexington and Georgetown and then finally to Jacksonville, Illinois? What did he do? Above all else, he sought to bring about the unity, the unity of all Christians who had been so long divided he said that he, quote, hoped to die pleading the cause of Christian unity. He lived that life. He was raised an Episcopalian. He was ordained a Presbyterian. He taught at a Methodist school. He had many Baptist friends. The thing that delighted Barton Stone most about the Cane Ridge Revival that August week of 1801 was the fact that Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians were all engaged in proclaiming the gospel together. Side by side, sometimes up to five preachers preaching from tree stumps and the backs of wagons and platforms in order to get a voice to the thousands who had gathered here. To the point that throughout that week of the revival, some three to 5,000 people made their confessions of faith. Keep in mind that in a time when about 10% of the population was affiliated with the church. And maybe 5% out here on the western frontier. Barton Stone just could never understand why one group of folks who confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, couldn't bring themselves to have communion together with another group of people who confessed Christ as Lord. He just didn't understand why when some people might see things one way and other Christians might see things another way, why they both wouldn't find a way to come together at the Lord's table his mantra was, let the unity of Christians be our polar star. The high point of Barton Warren Stone's life came on New Year's Day, 1832, in Lexington, on the front steps of what was called the Hill Street Christian Church, a stone's throw from where Rupp Arena is now, where followers of Barton Stone who called themselves Christians and followers of another man named Alexander Campbell who lived up in what is today Bethany, West Virginia, came together to join their movements on a handshake on the front porch, if you will, of the Hill Street Christian Church in Lexington, which was the forebear of our central Christian church. They shook hands and for the first time across the many, many ages, Christians had come together. For the hundreds of years before that, the church's story was one of division, 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 splintering, splintering over disagreements about doctrine or beliefs or practices or interpretation of, of scripture. 
But on that occasion, Christians actually came together, the Christian church and the disciples of Christ, to the point that Barton Warren Stone wrote, this union I view as the noblest act of my life. Until the day he died, Barton Warren Stone never desisted in the work of Christian unity and reconciliation after he moved from the uh, Lexington, Georgetown area and from Cane Ridge out to Jacksonville, Illinois at the end of his life, he found that there was a disciple church and a Christian church that had not yet united and Martin Stone refused to join either one of them until they came together. He wrote, in the fall of 1834, I moved my family to Jacksonville, Illinois, about 50 miles or so uh, northeast of St. Louis. Here, he said, I found two churches, a Christian and a disciples church. They worshiped in separate places. I refused to unite with either one until they united together and labored to effect it. It was effected. <laughs> he insisted that Christians come together. Mark then that as Stone's own were the spiritual ancestors of a man who labored throughout his life to unite Christians, to, to effect reconciliation. Speaking of which, reconciliation. Barton Stone was a man who was ahead of his time in matters of racial reconciliation and justice. As a young man, he saw slavery in, in South Carolina, and he wrote in his autobiography, my soul sickened at the sight of slavery. From the time of its construction in, in 1791, slaves attended worship here in the meeting house along with their masters, though they were uh, segregated in the balcony, what was called the slaves gallery. Uh, an area that was only accessed from the outside by a ladder leaning against the meeting house, coming up the ladder and into windows from the outside where the slaves could sit in the gallery. In 1801, during the revival, there were many blacks who were present and worshiping at the revival. That same year, 1801, 1801 now, Barton Warren Stone emancipated two slaves that had been willed to him by his mother. Emancipated them in, in 1801. I understand that there were many others in the Cane Ridge community who emancipated their slaves. I understand that there was a, a motion to excommunicate members of this church who were slaveholders. It didn't pass. But that stance toward the emancipation of slaves in 1801 earned the dismay of many others in this area toward the congregation of Cane Ridge. Cane Ridge's current curator, James Trader, gave a wonderful address on Cane Ridge Day back in 2010 on disciples and slavery. And he, he told how Barton Warren Stone's attitude and actions towards slavery evolved over time. James said that uh, in his early years, uh, Barton Stone was what might be called a gradualist. That is, he wanted slaves to be emancipated, but not until they had been educated and been given a proper trade, a marketable skill. In the next few years, he became uh, sort of interested in what was called the American Colonization Society. That was the proposal that freed slaves be sent back to Africa and be repatriated in what is current day Liberia, but Stone grew weary of that effort. And by 1833, he wanted to emancipate the slaves. He supported the immediate abolition of slavery. 
His children were at that time willed slaves from his mother-in-law's estate in Tennessee. And because of the legality of such, they weren't his slaves, they were his children's. He didn't have the legal authority to emancipate them, so he basically emancipated himself by moving to the free state of Illinois and thereby achieving the liberation of the slaves. Moved to the free state of Illinois. Mark then that as Stone's own we're the spiritual ancestors of a man who strove for racial justice and equality. I want you to know that Barton Stone was a good man. I was talking to Albert Pennybacker long distance earlier this week. I told him we were going to Cambridge. I said, Penny, you got anything to say about Barton Warren Stone? And Penny said, David, Alexander Campbell wanted you to think right Martin Warren Stone wanted you to live right. Oh, I just love that. And I would want you to know that as you read about Barton Warren Stone in his biography and in what others wrote about him, the man lived right. He was a good human being. In the obituary that appeared after his death, it was written, it is seldom that we are called upon to record the death of one so much beloved, so highly gifted, or so eminently pious. Another man wrote, His entire life was little else than a practical commentary on the pure faith and morality of the gospel he professed. He's now in heaven, the man wrote, and if Brother Stone is not prepared for the plaudit, well done, good and faithful servant, I question there lives a being on earth who is. Even his harshest critics were moved by the way he lived his life. One of them wrote, his life was sound, even though his doctrine was not. <laughs> A good man. Mark then that as Stone's own, we're the spiritual ancestors of a genuinely good man. It's no wonder then, is it, that on that August 21st of 1843, when he preached his final sermon in this church, the place was packed. What did he preach about? From this passage of Acts, he urged his disciples and followers to continue the quest for Christian unity. He urged them to be humble and benevolent always. He urged them to be righteous in all they said and did. And then, according to his biographer, John Rogers, he read uh, these words from Paul's final address to the elders in Ephesus. Barton Stone read, And now, behold, I know that all you among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. His biographer then writes, The closing scene which followed cannot be described. Never while reason holds its empire can this biographer forget that hour. Memory lingers about it with a mournful pleasure. A parting hymn is sung. The venerable speaker leaves the stand and meets his brothers and sisters on the floor. Tears flow plentifully as they grasp each other's hands. The song ended he knelt down and prayed with them all, prayed most fervently for the church and for the world, for the brothers and sisters who were present, that they might be faithful unto death and meet in heaven to part no more. The meeting dismissed, supported by two brethren, he walked to the house where he had been put up, on the way, 
when he got to a certain point, he stopped them. And he said, about this place stood the stand from which half a century ago I preached to the people. He then turned around. He looked at the old meeting house. He looked at the grove of trees and the graveyard. And with emotion, he said, I shall see this place no more. And he did it. Bart Warren Stone returned to Illinois. One year later, he died at his son-in-law's home in Hannibal, Missouri. His body was returned here. And he's buried here at Cane Ridge in the graveyard, surrounded by a grove of trees, by this old meeting house where he used to preach to the people. Your stone's own. Carry on his legacy. Amen? And amen. amen. It's always good to be properly humbled before coming to the Lord's table. Uh, yours truly has uh, been made aware that in my sermon, I said repeatedly that we are spiritual ancestors of Barton Warren Stone. No, spiritual descendants of his. It's good to come to a table where there's grace and mercy, and especially to come to this table at Cane Ridge this morning. 
when he was at school in North Carolina through those struggling years with religion, Barton Stone went to a worship service. And the preacher said the following, Barton Stone writes, in his description of a broken and contrite heart, I felt my own described. Hope began to rise and my sorrow-worn heart felt a gleam of joy. He urged all of this character to approach the Lord's table that day. And for the first time, I partook of the Lord's Supper. Would you join me in prayer at the table at Cane Ridge? Almighty God, we recognize that we are standing on holy ground. We know that there are angels all around. Those who came to these holy grounds in 1801 for the revival. Those who for the next 120 years called Cane Ridge their church home. Those who over the last century have made pilgrimage to this place. From across this country and around the world, we're standing on holy ground. And we pray, O oh God, that as we receive the bread, Christ's body broken for us, as we drink of the cup, His blood poured out for many. We ask that as we do this, O oh God, You would cleanse and refresh and renew us and then send us forth from this table to be of service, humbly, but joyfully and courageously, as you sent forth Barton Warren Stone to Lexington and beyond. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. That night in the upper room, Jesus gave thanks for the bread. He blessed and broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And after the supper, he gave thanks for the fruit of the vine. He poured it out. He gave it to his disciples. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sin. Drink of this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Almighty God, we pray as we leave this table and this holy place that the Holy Spirit that blew through these grounds in such powerful ways would go with us to uplift and carry and motivate us to be your people in this century in the spirit and character of Barton Warren Stone. In the name of Jesus Christ, his Lord and ours, we pray. Amen. Bart Warren Stone wrote this. He said, be an example in charity and love, not in word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth, by administering of your goods to the poor and the needy. As you contemplate your offerings to Central Christian Church, I want to ask you to do something else. I want to ask you to consider a personal gift to the Cane Ridge Meeting House. When I came out, I brought a check from Central Christian Church because our congregation, of course, has supported Cane Ridge through all these years, and Jenny and I brought our gift. But I want to encourage you to go online and to find the address for Cane Ridge Meeting House and to make your own gift to this holy place to continue its ministry and mission. May God bless and use our offerings always.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we're mindful of the words in the letter to the Hebrews. Since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, Receive our offerings, O God, and receive our lives, desiring to carry on the heritage that is ours through Cane Ridge. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. It is my pleasure to announce that Gerald and Kathy Bratz have decided to formally join Central Christian Church as members of our church family. And to be able to announce this at Cane Ridge is particularly special because Gerald and Kathy are longtime disciples. They are transferring their membership from First Christian Church in Longview, Texas. They have already become active members of our congregation through the Taking the Bible Serious class. Kathy's playing in the handbells. Gerald's coming to the men's breakfast. They have simply been a wonderful part of our congregation. And so from Cane Ridge, which is dear also to Gerald and Kathy, it's a particular pleasure to say welcome to the Central Christian family. I'm standing at the west door of the meeting house and I want to read the words on this plaque to you because they're meaningful to so many and, and personally to me. The west door of Cane Ridge Meeting House is dedicated to missionaries who have responded to the call to proclaim the Word of God to all people everywhere. I remember back in 1988 leaving this place and realizing that St. Louis was to the west where I was serving and I, I patted this plaque on my way out. And then in 2002, when Jenny and I were just beginning starting out in Arizona, I was flown back here for a new church planters training session. And we came out on our last night from Lexington to have a worship service at Cane Ridge. And I want to tell you the Holy Spirit was working that night. There was some perspiration and inspiration to be had. And as I was walking out this door, I realized I was going west to Phoenix, Arizona to try to plant a new church. And I patted the plaque. We're going from here back to Lexington, west of Paris, to continue our ministry. And in Barton Warren Stone's words, be an example in the spirit. Always cherish a meek, gentle, and quiet spirit. Be an example in faith. Prove to all by your works, your zeal, and labors of love that you heartily believe what you profess. Peace of Christ be with you. <laughs>